Pro-life warrior Abby Johnson joins us today. Abby will discuss where the right to life movement is one year after the historic Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She'll also explain Planned Parenthood's dark agenda to destroy the family and why is this abortion provider so involved in the gender affirming care movement? This is gonna be very interesting, so stay with us. Welcome to the Moms for America podcast. Each week, special guests tackle the issues facing the moms of America today. Discussions include personal stories and advice on how moms can build a strong foundation of faith, family, and freedom in their homes and country. Hi, moms. I'm Debbie Carlitis, your host, and welcome to the Moms for America podcast. I'm so glad that you are joining us again this week, right? We are here uh, every week to inspire, encourage, and educate moms in their journey through motherhood. Right here at the top of the show, we do want to invite you to like, subscribe, and share our podcast with your mom friends. This is how we get the information out. So moms, please share the podcast and share our information. If you have any ideas for our podcast, would you please email me at podcast at momsamerica.net? I would love, love to hear from you and any suggested topics or guests that you may want to share. I do want to invite all of you moms that are listening right here at the top of the show to join our movement here at Moms for America. It's moms like us all across the country uniting together to fight for faith family, freedom, and the Constitution. You can check out all of our information at momsforamerica.us. So please, please stop by there, join the movement, and take advantage of all of our programs, uh, our information, our uh, webinars, everything that we have there for you mamas. Uh, we're here to serve you. All righty, on to today's program. Well, Abby Johnson joins us again for the second time on our podcast. We're thrilled to have her. Uh, many of you know Abby from Unplanned, the book and the movie based on her life story. If you have not seen it, you must watch it. It is an amazing story with a great outcome, a beautiful testimony. Abby was a former Planned Parenthood leader who had a life-altering experience when she assisted in an abortion. What she saw made her cross over to the pro-life side. Abby travels the world educating the public on pro-life issues now and she discusses the dark side of Planned Parenthood because Abby was an insider. So this is gonna be a very, very interesting discussion. Well, special welcome to Abby Johnson, uh, Warrior Mama, and we are so glad to have you, Abby, on the Moms for America podcast for the second time. Yes, thank you so much for having me. All right, Abby, um, I know that most of the ladies know your story. Um, and it is a powerful story. I don't want to go back to that because I've got so much I want to talk with you that is happening currently and, mm -hmm. and um, to come, I should say. But I do want to encourage everyone, please check out Abby's story, Unplanned. It is amazing. She has a great podcast. She has all kinds of information about what happened in her life and her journey. So here, I want to just let everybody know again, what's your tribe like? How many kids do you have? Um, what is your your home like? It's awfully quiet over there for the mm -hmm. amount of children you have. How are you doing it, girl? <laughs> well, yeah, I have eight kids and <laughs> uh, actually I have three at home today. They're, they go to a, um, an amazing Christian school, but uh, we only have one still at home. He'll be in school next year and we won't know what to do with ourselves. Actually, <laughs> my husband, my husband's a teacher, so he's going to be teaching. He's a stay at home dad right now, but next year he'll go back to work and he'll be teaching at the kids school. So that'll be fun. And, um, yeah. And then our house is going to be empty. So it's going to be weird, but I have three home today because, uh, two of them aren't feeling good. So it's, it is quiet though. It's, it's really quiet. Usually, <laughs> I, there's a moment in an interview <laughs> where my little one Fulton will like bust in the door and, you know, interrupt me, but it's, you know, that's just life. That's just, that is. it's life. It's life. So it's being a mom, right? Well, that's congratulations right. to you for having such a beautiful tribe. Uh, mm -hmm. what, again, what an amazing testimony you have and what God has done in you and through you and in your home. So let's catch up here. So it's one year uh, past the Supreme Court um, decision when they overturned Roe v. Wade, which was a great victory for us. 
I kind of like to just hear your take on what do you think has transpired uh, transpired this past year since uh, the Roe v. Wade decision? Well, I mean, we have seen certainly state efforts increase. And, uh, you know, a lot of states, I live in Texas, um, you know, a lot of states like Texas and and others, we had, you know, trigger bans. So um, we have seen some states uh, where abortion was, uh, you know, almost immediately illegal and mm-hmm. unavailable in, in some states. Um, we have seen other states like Florida in this past year, you know, pass legislation to uh, seriously limit abortion. So, you know, now in Florida, they've got a a six week uh, abortion ban, which that's great. Um, You know, and then on the flip side, we have seen some states that really, you know, they really thought that they were going to be able to ban abortion. Uh, Kansas had a ballot measure failed. Uh, South Carolina tried to ban abortion recently that failed. Um, I think that what this has done, hopefully is particularly with Kansas. That was one of the, that was one of the first state measures we saw go through, or they were trying to ban abortion through a ballot vote and it failed. And I think what that should have shown us, what it should have taught us is that, Conservatives cannot just sit back Mm. and expect pro-life legislation to pass. Right. And I think that, and and I see this often, you know, I go to people, I I go into a lot of events in California and people are like, really California? Wow. Can't believe you're doing pro-life events in California. I'm like, listen, the greatest pro-life events I do are in California. Wow. The, the most well-attended pro-life events I do are in California and people can't believe it. I'm like, listen, they're not taking anything for granted Mm. in states like California, states Mm -hmm. like Oregon, states like Washington, uh, states like, you know, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I'm in Illinois. We've got the same thing. We're we're battling. We're fighting. Exactly. I go to states like that. I go to these really blue states, biggest turnout of pro-lifers, largest events I go to. People are on fire right? Yeah. Because they are fighting. Yeah. You guys are fighting. I yeah. go to places like Texas, they can barely get people to show up to their pro-life events. Uh, I go to, you know, I go to these other, you know, red states, deep red states. They, ha- they have a hard time getting people to show up because everybody in these, in these red states, they take what they have for granted. And I'm telling mm-hmm. you, if people keep doing that, if conservatives keep doing that, they will find their states blue in yeah. the next five years. Right. People have got to get out. They have got to start voting. And if this has shown us anything, it should be if the votes, you know, like South Carolina and Kansas and these other states that have tried to ban abortion have failed. It should show us that we cannot take anything for granted as right. conservatives because the Democrats are showing up. Right. These these liberals, they will bust people in. They will pay people to vote. They will sure cheat. Will. They will do anything to win and to get their liberal agenda passed through. Right. So a year later, we're at the we're at the uh, legislative points in, in states all across America fighting um, for uh, for life. Mm-hmm. So we've seen some victories, we've seen some defeats, and we've seen people just really not be engaged. So to the moms listening, we've got to be engaged in the fight for life in our state. That's what Roe v. Wade did. When they overturned that, they said, mm-hmm. here states, you go figure it out, which is what we were hoping, right? Because then we yeah. have more accessibility to the legislators and to the legislation. So now now uh, an, another big discussion is the abortion pill, right? Because yeah. it's becoming more accessible for treatment. Uh, we know from your movie, and I, when I talk about this, I can't, re- I, I can't forget the moment in the movie when you dealt with this situation because you were treated with this, I don't know, exact pill, but this, uh, you know, this ideal of, of taking, you know, getting rid of the baby, aborting the baby. Um, this has become a big focus. Can you talk to us about the abortion pill? Mm-hmm. Because I don't know if people understand what it is and that it may be coming to your CVS or your Walgreens or your chain in your neighborhood and you can go and get it like you go and get an antibiotic. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So, 
Uh, the abortion pill, as we know it today in the United States, is a two-step process. It's a two-medication process. The first pill is called mifepristone. That pill is one pill. You take that, and that is what actually kills the baby. So that pill starves the baby of progesterone, and mm -hmm. progesterone is essentially food for a baby. That's what keeps the baby alive. So it cuts off that, um, that feed of, of progesterone to the baby kills the baby. Uh, then you take a second round of pills. There's four pills. It's 800 micrograms of misoprostol. Misoprostol is a pill that will bring on labor. So it starts contractions of the uterus and the woman at home in a hotel, at a dorm room, at her friend's house, wherever she is, uh, will begin to, her uterus will begin to contract and she will expel that baby wherever she is. Um, and then she makes a decision. Uh, am I going to flush my baby down the toilet? In almost all instances, she does. Um, the medication abortion regimen, this chemical abortion pills, um, it, it is four times more dangerous, more risky than a surgical abortion. And this is why there's a significant risk of hemorrhage. There is also a significant risk of infection. The reason that there's a, such a high risk of infection is because you take these pills and maybe you pass all of your baby. But the reality is that many women do not pass all of their baby. Maybe they pass some of the extremities, maybe they pass all of the body, but they leave the head is left in the woman's womb. Um, they are not, the pills may not be strong enough to pass all of, of the baby, all of the tissue. And so some of it may be left in her womb and she may not know that she may not know sure. that some of it is still left. Sure. And so that can cause sepsis, um, mm. that can cause a septic infection and that can actually lead uh, to death in these women. The scariest part about it right now is that as soon as Roe was overturned, there were over 70 websites that popped up where women without seeing a physician, without being under any sort of medical care, women of any age. So young girls, they do not verify date of birth. They do not check ID. Any young girl, any woman can go on one of these 70 websites. They can put in their information. They don't have to have an ultrasound. They don't have to know how far along they are in their pregnancy. They can go online. They can answer a series of questions and they can get these pills sent to any address that they want them to be sent to. And, uh, under no medical guidance, they take this, they take these pills wherever they are and maybe it's successful. Maybe it's not, they don't know because no. they have no ultrasound. We don't even know if the this pregnancy is, is in their uterus or not. They could have an ectopic pregnancy. Let me tell you something. If you have an ectopic pregnancy and wow. you take these pills, you will probably die. And that's this... what's going on right now. And, and the left is calling this progress for women. What in the world? I knew it was bad, but when you lay it out all together like that, because I've heard pieces of this, it is, uh, it's horrific. Mm -hmm. It is horrific. Uh, is a ban on the abortion pill? Is that the strategy? Can we stop this? Should this be, how should we approach this? I mean, this is devastating because we know that our, our young girls could be doing this in the privacy of, of a bathroom with their, their mom downstairs. Right. Yeah, they absolutely could. And the, I think the, the worst part, one of the worst parts about the mailing in of these drugs to people's homes is that this creates, abortion always creates a safe haven for abusers, right? Mm. But, and we know that, but yeah. this in particular, you know, a 13 year old being able to get online and access these pills and have them sent somewhere, there's no oversight. Terrible. Nobody right. is watching this. Nobody is seeing this. I mean, she could right. be getting these pills to cover up the fact that her soccer coach has been abusing her. Right. Of course. Right. Nobody's checking. 
Nobody's, Nobody's laying eyes on this girl. Nobody is noticing that, hey, this girl is actually 13 years old and pregnant. This something may be wrong here, right? This is reportable because yes. she could be going online and, and putting in a fake date of birth and nobody's checking. Nobody cares. And that <sighs> is terrifying that to is. me. Um, so it, it, it is very scary. I, you know, the thing is, I, the Alliance Defending Freedom came forward and they, you know, they put forth this lawsuit that went through Texas right. and they were trying to ban the first pill the mifepristone pill. Okay. And they said, you know, this is what we're trying to do. And, and they, you know, it, it worked for it, the, the judge in Texas said, okay, we're going to ban the pill, the mifepristone pill. Uh, the Supreme court now has, has overturned that. Right. And pro-lifers were excited. A lot of pro-lifers were excited. And they said, oh my gosh, this bans, this bans chemical abortion, but that's not true. Um, they celebrated a, a little, um, a little overzealous, a yeah. little, okay. little overzealous, I think. Okay. Um, so banning mifepristone really doesn't do anything. And here's why, mm. because the abortion industry already has a backup plan for how to, uh, administer medication abortion without mifeprex and, or mifepristone. And of that course. is using misoprostol only. So doing misoprostol only abortions using Which just is. the misoprostol, the second pill that causes the uterus to contract. Okay. What this means is that you aren't delivering a dead baby. It no. means that you are delivering a live baby because the, the mifepristone is what actually kills the baby. And then you deliver. So if you don't have the mifepristone to kill the baby, then you're delivering a baby that's alive. And is, they already have this. This and, and actually, misoprostol-only abortions have been done for, for years, for decades, in many countries. They were done for decades in Canada, Mexico, all across Europe. Uh, Mifeprex wasn't the mifepristone that pill wasn't actually allowed in the bulk of European countries it was just allowed in Canada a few years ago Mexico hasn't been using mifepristone so misoprostol only abortions are actually uh, the common chemical abortion method in the overwhelming majority of other countries wow. so it's a very common method it's even riskier um, doing mesoprostol only abortions, but they're ready to do it. They have, <sighs> look, banning one type of chemical abortion is not going to stop them from killing babies mm -hmm. by pills. And, and that's what we need to understand as pro-lifers, right? There's a bigger picture here, right? The, the agenda, yeah. the agenda doesn't stop. No. And right. I remember when, I remember when, you know, there were groups that were out here saying, oh, we need to ban dismemberment abortions, right? We're going to stop dismemberment abortions. And I thought, how stupid. Wait, they're just going to abort these babies another way. Yeah. They're not going to stop. Stop. And what that meant was they wanted to ban D&E abortions. They wanted to, to uh, ban a certain type of abortion. That doesn't mean they're going to stop doing abortions in the second trimester. They're just going to do them a different way. Mm -hmm. It was like when, it was like when, you know, the federal government banned partial birth abortion. Absolutely. Partial birth abortion should have been banned. It's a terrible, inhumane thing. And everybody said, oh, great. They're going to ban partial birth abortion. Now third trimester abortions aren't going to happen. That's ridiculous. Of course, third trimester abortions are still happening. Now they're just giving them a fatal dose of cardiac medication and causing these babies to have a heart attack in the womb instead of doing partial birth abortions. Listen, our goal as pro-lifers yeah. is not to just ban certain types of abortions. We are not the movement that says, look, you can kill a baby this way, right. but you can't kill a baby that way. Right. We are a movement that says you should not All be life. killing babies. Right. <laughs> right. Right. We're a movement that says we're here to ban all abortions, right. not just a certain type of abortion. We don't right. want you to kill babies, period. Because so, they will keep reinventing, right, Abby? That's right. what your point Absolutely. is. Absolutely. They are never work, going to stop. They're never going to stop. They're just evil and they're sick and it doesn't matter. And, and their agenda is far and wide. 
is it shock you how um, committed, I guess it doesn't shock you, you worked there, you saw this. It doesn't surprise you how committed they are to taking life. No, the only thing that has surprised me, honestly, since since Roe was overturned, um, was the mobile abortion RVs. That that was the only thing that's really surprised me. So, you know, Planned Parenthood and and other abortion entities, they you know they got these RVs and they started you know just sort of perusing the state lines. Right. of these conservative states and basically, you know, parking in abandoned Walmart parking lots or whatever, and just said, you know, Hey, uh, c- you know, come get in this van. You can get an abortion. It's so freaking so, weird that, that, that really has been the only thing that I I've just been like, wow, right. guys. I mean, really I, that, yeah. that was, that was a little bit shocking to me, but right. um, look, we're dealing with demonic right. forces here. Right. Um, we're dealing with child sacrifice. So yeah. the same, you know, demonic forces that we read about in the Old Testament, right? Right. People were sacrificing their children to Molech and Baal, Baal. right? And, right. And exactly. we, we read that in the Old Testament. We're like, that's crazy, right? Like right. who would do that? That's nuts. We're doing the same thing today. Right. We're just calling it something more palatable, right? We're not right. calling it child sacrifice. We're calling it terminating your pregnancy or right. reproductive justice or choice or whatever, right? But it, it in the end, it's it's right. all the same. It's all the right. same thing. Right. The global, we're talking about America. You just referred to the different countries with the abortion pill and what they've been doing. The, the global um, agenda, I guess is probably even more shocking to all of us, right? We've had a guest on that talked about um, the International Planned Parenthood's global agenda, the sexual rights of children, which is another Mm -hmm. podcast that people have to listen to because children do not have sexual rights, right? Children should be thinking about sex. We need to protect them from sex. And I I know that this is another uh, area that you're talking about is this global campaign that Planned Parenthood is doing to um to con- not only to take the babies and to, to terminate these children but then to confuse the children with hypersexuality and grooming and abuse and gender confusion and gender identity issues i I love to get your take on that too because mm-hmm. i know you're speaking out about that as well i mean this this goes down to the heart and soul of each of these young women about caring a child and who they are and their gender mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So a lot of people are kind of shocked when I I start talking, you know, people are like, oh, Abby, why do you, you know, I've always talked about abortion a lot. That's kind of my wheelhouse. Right. And I've started past recent years talking a lot about the LGBTQI, whatever um, agenda. And people are like, why are you talking so much about that? And I'm like, listen, these two movements are married to each other. Um, They're very much. Let's say that again. These two movements are married together. I think this is what we yes. do. We have everything in silos, but we don't realize, right, Abby, how everything is connected and yeah. the agenda is fluid between them. Go ahead. Yeah, they're very much connected. And people are like, why? That doesn't make any sense. Well, it really does make sense. And uh, if you think about it, and this is why, both of these movements are profoundly anti-life. And I'll explain that in a minute. And they're profoundly anti-God. So both of these movements are not the root cause of the evil. Both of these movements are symptoms of the root cause of the evil. And the root cause of the evil is the destruction of the family and really the destruction of the image of God, right? So we, and when I talk about, you know, the, um, being profoundly anti-life. Here's here's really what's happening. About, I don't know, probably 20, 25% of the people I worked with at Planned Parenthood were part of the LGBT movement, okay? And there's something really ironic, really sad about a person whose sexual activities do not create life, right? 
mm-hmm. um, they are not able to procreate, right? So there's something really odd about someone whose activities do not create life telling another woman who mm-hmm. has life in her womb that she should destroy that life. Mm. But that is the goal. The goal is population control to suppress the population to destroy the family and um, and to destroy that that holy image of God and that that image of the family that God has given us, mother, right. father, child, right right that to was destroy his that, right to destroy that holy family, that right. image of the holy family that God gave gave to us. And, um, and so of course, Planned Parenthood's graphic sex education program begins in kindergarten. And it's not that they're in kindergarten telling these little children, you know, oh, let's talk about abortion in kindergarten. The, the, you know, the material is, is really entirely appropriate. They're talking about boundaries and this is my body and your body and right. They're not doing anything the program isn't teaching kids anything that I wouldn't want my kids to learn, right? That's not the point of them being that the point of them being in kindergarten is to develop a trusting relationship with your children because that's what groomers do. Ah. And they are groomers. They get into your child's life at a very young, at a very early, a very vulnerable age. They want to develop that trusting relationship and they want to start telling your children things like, You don't need to trust your parents about these issues. You need to trust me. Yeah. Your parents don't understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're going through. Mm -hmm. When you start having questions about your sexuality, don't go to your parents. Come to me. Yeah. This is what they're doing. And people are like, oh, Abby, how do you know they're saying that? Because I used to say that to children. I know what they're saying. I was trained as a Planned Parenthood sex education teacher. I know what they're saying. These are things I used to say to children. These are things we were taught to say in our educator classes. Planned Parenthood's entire goal is to break down children's modesty, their natural modesty, to insert language that these children would never use to insert these things in their minds insert this language and terminology they would never use to get them confused, to get them to start thinking about things they wouldn't naturally think about so that they will begin questioning themselves and questioning their own identities, things that they would not usually be questioning unless someone put it, inserted it into their minds. And then to break that parent child trusting relationship. relationship. That is Planned Parenthood's plan. And that is what a groomer does to children. And that's why I can call Planned Parenthood educators and these other sex positive educators groomers, because that is the definition of a groomer. And when we attach, when the parents don't know what's going on, and I I hope to God most of our parents or all of our parents see and understand and know what's going on in their schools and have made adjustments, uh, either homeschooling, private education, doing whatever you need to do going to that school board, the agenda is bold. Uh, Mm -hmm. The agenda is starting in kindergarten, just like you said. Um, The websites that they're directing the kids to has a male dressed as a female discussing, this is your safe place. You just exactly what you said. They create these, this atmosphere of don't talk to your parents at home because they're not going to support you. Mm -hmm. Come to us. We'll take care of you. So your, your point is Planned Parenthood, uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is I don't think we've looked at Planned Parenthood in this, in this light that confused children, mutilating children, giving them hormone therapy at such a young age. No one would ever think that this is attached to, to Planned Parenthood, but it is just, it is a part of all these, all the bad people are together and they've all got the same mission. Yes. And this is not new for Planned Parenthood. So people think, oh, all this gender stuff, this is new for Planned Parenthood. This is not new. I left Planned okay. Parenthood in 2009. Okay. We were piloting cross-sex hormone therapy at my facility in 2008. Wow. So this has been going on since 2008. So for 15 years, 
we have been giving Planned Parenthood has been giving cross-sex hormones to confused individuals for 15 years. This is not new. They okay. saw this on the horizon. I mean, I would go out on a limb to say, I would bet money to say that the people who are uh, pushing forward this gender confusion agenda are in cahoots with the people with the the people who are creating medical protocols at Planned mm -hmm. Parenthood Federation of America. They are working together to create these these progressive agendas. There's no way that Planned Parenthood would have known 15 years ago mm -hmm. that this is going to be a big deal in, you know, 10, 15 years from now if they hadn't have been working with these LGBT people behind the scenes. They know. That's what I'm saying. They're married to each other. They know. That's why you see Planned Parenthood sponsoring all these yeah. drag shows. It's why you see Planned Parenthood sponsoring yeah. all the pride parades. They have banners there. They're in with the HIV testing communities. They are married to each other. They are so enmeshed. And they work behind the scenes with each other. They have to be. And uh, that's that's why Planned Parenthood has been in on this for 15 years. So, and now it's gotten so, um, it's gotten so bad now. I mean, a, a, a child, a teenager, a young teen can go to Planned Parenthood and get cross-sex hormones and their parents don't know anything about it. So, and, and this is where Planned Parenthood is going to have to go. So, I mean, people need to hear me when I'm saying this. When Roe was overturned and abortion clinics started closing, I thought, okay, this is going to be the new financial frontier for Planned Parenthood is transitioning, particularly children, but transitioning people from one sex to the next, because you've got all of these empty abortion surgical suites. And what can they do with them? They can't do abortions anymore in them. What can they do with them? They can bring OBGYNs into those surgical suites and they can transition a man to a woman or woman to a man. They can do those genital surgeries Ugh. inside of those surgical suites. And why even mess with an abortion? An abortion, you know, a woman's paying what? $600 for an abortion. If okay. you can successfully transition a male to a female or a female to a male, if you can do that, if you can do that surgery, that alone for that one patient in the lifetime of that patient, you're making about $100,000. Who cares? about $600 for an abortion. If you can make a hundred thousand dollars on one patient, mark my words, this is going to be the new financial frontier for Planned Parenthood. Wow. That is, that is so disturbing. I just, I think about this next generation and I think, oh God, save their hearts and their souls. And what can we do to fight this? What can we do to be, uh, on the front lines of this, where, where do we go, Abby? I mean, that is so overwhelming. And I know that when we say things like this, and I know you're, you're kind of alluding to the fact that like you've been saying this, speaking this and kind of forecasting, people still go, really? Do you really think that that can happen? Look what is happening. They're mm -hmm. saying it's okay for two and three-year-olds to transition. They're mm -hmm. saying that children can cut, you know, cut off their body parts without a, without a parent knowing. It is here and it's only getting more radical. What can we do? What to Speak to the moms out there. We've got a lot, what, a third of the population now of these kids are mm -hmm. confused about their sexuality. This is aggressive. This may be 50% soon. So, you know, mamas, <clears throat> you have to keep your kids off social media. Um, and you may be the unpopular mom for a while. Right. Um, but I can tell you right now, my 16 year old has zero social media. She has, um, I mean, she doesn't have access to the internet. She has no social media. Um, I went to 18 with my son mm -hmm. and, and she won't, as long as she's living in this house, she won't. Yeah. Um, the only time she has access to, to, to the internet is if she needs to look something up for school and it's on my computer and it's in the dining room where we can all see what she's looking at. Um, it's, we're giving our children far too much access to the internet. We are allowing them on these social media platforms. 
that are literally looking to indoctrinate our children. That is what they're there for. It's what they're trying to do now. And if you have not seen the documentary called Social Dilemma, people should watch it. Um, it's it's one of the most eye-opening documentaries I think I've ever seen uh, about, it was all these whistleblowers from Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter. Um, these are the people that helped to create it who are coming forward now and talking about how damaging these social media platforms are. Yeah. And I mean, of course you can use it for good. I'm on Facebook. I'm, you, you know, I mean, we've, gosh, we've saved lives. We've saved babies. We've done all kinds right. of good work on there, you know, but a 16 year old, a 13 year old, a 12 year old, they do not need to be on these social media platforms. They just don't. Right. So that's the first thing I would say, if your kids are on it, make the right decision and get them off. And it right. doesn't matter how much they throw a fit. doesn't matter how much they cry and wail. Um, they really just don't need to have, they don't need to have access to that. So I would say that's number one. Um, number two, uh, I, I would say, you know, do everything possible to get your kids out of public school mm -hmm. and homeschooling may not be an option for you. It's, it's not something I ever felt called to do with my kids. Um, but we have them in a, a really great, um, private Christian school. And I'm very involved with my kids at the school. I'm up there all the time. And studies show that the more active you are with your kids, the better behaved your kids are and the better right. friends they have. Yeah, that's um, right. You can see everything that's going on. You can that's right. speak to and, it. Right? Uh, and so, you know, I know the curriculum that my kids are learning at the school. Yeah. I know their teachers. I go on every field trip. I mean, I'm there all the time. Yeah. And uh, studies will show that your children just do better the more yeah. your a parent is at the school. Um, you know, we have our, our kids have always had a parent at home with them. And I yeah. think if that's possible, um, I think that is the best case scenario. And listen, um, our family, we've had to sacrifice a lot to have, yeah. you know, one parent at home and one parent working, and we've had to sacrifice cable TV and we've had to sacrifice, you know, the cars that we want. And we've had right. to do a lot of things. Um, you know, you we do don't, what you gotta do, right? We don't live in our dream house and, you know, we have a, a small house for eight children, but, um, you know, we just do what we have to do because it's very important to us that we don't have two parents working outside of the home, yeah. um, that our kids come home to a parent that we pick them up every day from school and we drop them off and you know, that we're home with them. We yeah. can go on those field trips. We can do yeah. those things. So, um, that's another thing that we always suggest that seems to be highly controversial, but it wasn't controversial when we were growing up, you know, right. it was yeah, just, my mom was always home. I yeah, always knew so I was, was walking home to, right. So and I was able to stay home with my kids. So I, and I just, you know, here, here's what we tell the moms too. And I know you're saying the same thing, Abby, you just have to get creative. You have That's to right. freelance. I mean, you have an opportunity now with online to do yeah. just about anything. You used to have to really leave the home to do anything substantial unless you were going to babysit as a side note. Yep. Right. But now you can work from home, whatever you want, 20 hours a week, or you can go and work at the school. My sister, unless she went and worked at the school so she could avoid, uh, afford the private education. That's right. You just got to do what you got to do. You just have to Make do it. it. Work. That's right. And, uh, and so, you know, and the other thing I would say is we need to be having these intentional conversations with our kids all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my 16 year old daughter and I, we talk about everything, everything. I mean, She's got uh, just the sweetest boyfriend. And the first time that they kissed, I was the first person she called. Um, and I think that we need to be having these really open and honest conversations with our kids. Um, so much so that they feel comfortable to tell us anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want there to be secrets between me and my kids. Right. And I don't want, you know, I want my daughter to feel like she can tell me anything, the bad stuff, the hard stuff, the embarrassing stuff. Um, and she does, you know, so far we do have that kind of relationship and we have been intentional about talking about abortion and homosexuality and this transgender thing. And so she comes and asks me questions and the hard questions, you know, because I want her asking me and not her peers and not the world, right? right. I want her coming to me. But right. we have been having these open conversations with our kids since they were very, very young, you know, and we made a commitment, Doug and I made a promise that we would never 
not answer a question when our kids ask. Mm. And so if our kids ask, then we are like, okay, they're ready to hear an answer. And so we yeah. answer it. And, yeah. um, and so I think that that's really important, not putting yeah. off those hard conversations and just handling them, you know, head on. Yeah. And I know that's the fourth one I'm going to mention here is something that you're passionate about. And you've raised your kids in the church. Yes. We have to bring back yes. faith to our families. Yeah. And I know that is a given, but a lot of moms are just yeah. not in church. They're not raising their kids with, um, you know, with biblical principles and a biblical worldview. So we can only push moral so far, but if we have a foundation, I know how important that is to you. One last, just push for the moms to um, restore, you know, Christ in their home and hope mm -hmm. in their home. Yeah. Because the world is just full of death. Well, and we do, you know, in our home and we're, gosh, we're certainly not perfect, but we try to right. read a Bible story every night. Um, you know, we pray together before bed. We always do that, but, um, you know, we try to read a Bible story, um, you know, every night before bed, we pray together. Um, we say a prayer in the car on the way to school, um, you know, just praying for a good day, just little things like that, you know, and yes, we're in church every Sunday. And I think a lot of, a lot in our culture right now, gosh, we we're being told that we need to prioritize so many things over God and over church. It, it makes me, it breaks my heart whenever I drive, you know, we're driving to church and we see all these people like playing soccer and there's all these little league things going on on Sunday morning. And I'm like, no, don't prioritize sports right. over church. Don't prioritize competitions over sports. There there's like a less than 1% chance that your kid it's going to make it to the NFL, right? <laughs> but there's a hundred percent chance yeah. that your child is going to stand in front of his or her creator one yeah. day. Wow. And that is the so most true. important thing you can do for your kids is to get them in church and to help them understand that they need to have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Bam. What a great note to end this interview on. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it, Abby. Can you let us let the moms know where they can find out more information about you? What's the best bit place to hear your podcast and get your information? Yeah. So um, my website is just Abby, A-B-B-Y, J.com. And my podcast are, is there. Um, you can listen to it online uh, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. My podcast is called Politely Rude. And <laughs> um, but yeah, it's online and all the information about my uh, ministries or on my website and um, just, yeah, a bunch of information is there. Thank you for being a warrior. Thank you for coming on and talking about the, the dark side of Planned Parenthood. And I know these are heavy topics, right? Yeah. But yeah. there are topics we have to discuss. And at the end of the day, there is hope. Moms, you, you're raising these children. They are yours. Don't let the world come in and take them, right? Like Abby right. said, let's let's be aggressive. Let's look at all the answers and the options and raise them and raise them good. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Abby. God bless you. And thanks for coming on again. We appreciate you Thank so you. much. Of course, anytime. Thank you. Ultimately, mamas, it is a spiritual battle. Um, that's what we talked about today. It really is a tough battle. But when a woman's heart like Abby is changed by God, they look at the preborn through a whole new lens. For any mamas that are out there that might have also had an abortion, that is a part of Abby's story too. We know that there is healing and that there is forgiveness and there is redemption through Christ. So mamas, uh, please go on your journey of healing and let God restore you. Amen. All right, moms, I do want to just here at the end of the show, remind you to visit our website at momsforamerica.us to learn more about Moms for America. Uh, while you're there, would you sign up for our weekly newsletter? Uh, this is really a great newsletter because it will help you get educated and informed on issues that relate to you as a mom and all of the programs, initiatives, seminars that we're doing. So moms, please sign up for our newsletter when you visit our website. Uh, also, when you come to our website, I do want to tell you about checking out our signature program, which is called the Cottage Meetings. All right. These 12 lessons will inspire and educate you about America's amazing heritage so that you can share those principles of liberty 
in your home and in your community. This program, along with many of our other programs on our website, will help you impact your family in a very powerful way. Also, we have the Healing of America series going on. So it is another incredible program that teaches you all about the Constitution. Alrighty, so from parental rights to public policy, from the kitchen table to Congress, Moms for America truly does have it all. So please check us out and join the movement. We say this every week, moms. We believe that liberty begins at home, and we believe that you moms are the heartbeat of America. You are the greatest influencers in your children's lives and truly in this culture. Moms are the ones that are going to save this country. Uh, I can't wait to see you back here next week because we will have another informative and inspiring episode of our podcast. Uh, like, subscribe, and share this. And remember, moms, let's keep changing our world one home at a time, and I will talk with you soon.